Hello Mario! In this video I'm going to be taking a real basic look at survey grade RTK GNSS. Now there's a lot of acronyms in there so let's have a look at a couple of them. RTK Real Time Kinematic. That means you get your answers at the rover as, you'll, as I'll explain on the data record in real time while you're there. That's the way to go. Real-time kinematic. Now, GNSS. Well, some of you may be familiar with GPS, Global Positioning System. Now, that's the American system that was developed with the American satellites. But since then, we've been able to add in the GLONASS satellites from the Russian system and a few others from around the world to give an overarching global navigation satellite system. So this includes all of the satellites from all of the countries that have satellites up there circling the earth that enable us to be able to determine position on the surface of the earth. Position is determined from the satellites by the GPS receivers. They are able to work out their position based on the satellite positions from information sent to the receiver by the satellites. As a general rule you need four or five or more satellites to get a really good strong and accurate position. So let's have a look at this RTK. So what is the basic setup for what's known as RTK? Oops there's another acronym there which I have explained earlier but I'll just explain it again. RTK, Real Time Kinematic. Alright, so here's your basic setup. First of all, in, in the box as you'll find it, you'll get your what's known as the base receiver or the base. Very similar looking is the rover. Usually in the box it's a good idea to write base on one and rover on the other and to always put them in the same place back in the box usually, I've found. Here we have the data recorder. This is where all of the information that we measure in the field and record in the field is held so that we can take that back to the office and download our information. Here we have a couple of little radio aerials. These go on each the base and the rover and enable them to communicate by radio and I'll explain that a little bit later on. Um, here we have the, um, there are ah, other bits of equipment and kit that you need. Here we have the, the base on a, a 250mm pole um, set in a tri -brack. It could be a base or a rover, but typically it's the base. And here we have in a field situation, we have the base set up here in the, um, in the field. And here we have our survey party with the rover here on a looks like a two meter fixed carbon fiber pole and down here we have our data recorder so there's all of the elements in place we can see our little radio antenna here and the base um, believe me you can, we can't see that but it's communicating with the rover one of the things that we do at the base is um, we measure its height it's usually set up over a known mark and um, so it's very important that we measure the height. Now if it is set up over the known mark, of course that height affects every other height or every other measurement that we make. So it's very important that the height of the base be recorded correctly. And it's a really good idea to independently check the height of the base. One of the ways of doing this is to measure the height of the base um, twice. Uh, or you could measure it once in meters and another one another time in feet and meters and then while you're in the field using the calculator on the data recorder calculate or convert one to the other um, remember feet times 0.3048 will give you meters and just to make sure because that's really good the base is the important part of the whole RTK system it should be set up on a very solid tripod 
um, with an independently checked height and it sometimes pays to go back from time to time just to check that the, the tripod is there. It should also be set in a very secure position, that is that someone's not going to pinch it or take off with it while it, the, it's out of your sight. So um, we can get a rather wide range with these. Quite often in some um, sort of dodgy areas it's necessary to leave someone at the base just to make sure that it stays in place over the mark and is there when you come to go home. So how does it work? Well without really going into detail about how the base measures the its position from the satellites I'm just going to stick with um, a fairly basic situation and that is that the base is able by getting information from the satellites to get a position which I would call the satellite position. Now in the typical setup but not always the case it is possible for us we usually as I say set the base up over a known point. It's not always necessary but for the purposes of this we'll, we'll go over a known point. So the base can determine its position from the satellites. It can then determine a correction to that position based on the known mark. It can then, so that's step one. Step two, it calculates the correction from the satellite position to the known position. It then sends a signal via the radio to the radio and by the radio to the rover and it tells the rover you know what correction it is applying at the base now at the rover the rover this similar sort of bit of kit to the base it can measure its position from the satellites and then it just applies the correction to determine its current position and it can do this very quickly so we have um, the base over a known mark determines a correction from the satellite position to the known position, radios the known position to the rover, the rover applies, radios the correction um, to the rover, the rover applies the correction and can work out immediately where it is. Now this is all great stuff and then we have of course the data recorder and the data recorder can record the position of the rover at any time or alternatively we can set the data recorder to stake out a particular position so that enables us with the rover to move to a position that where we want to be where we can set out a peg or a stake or the height and um, what have you. Now the with the satellites we can work out all three components X, Y and Z. Now X and Y I term position and Z is your heights. Now as a general rule with uh, GNSS or GPS whatever you want to choose to call it it can determine position better than it can determine height and generally it's like a 2 to 1 so if it can determine it determines position round about plus or minus um, 20 to 30 mils and typically and then for heights of course it can maybe 50 mil so this is um, GPS is, is better at position than it is at heights and uh, this this is the reason why some people uh, don't like um, using GPS uh, for accurate uh, or where accurate heighting is required such as in the set out of um, roading and things like that. It very much depends on, on particular situations but we do need to be very careful about that. And so our position, if we're just measuring the position that's recorded in the data recorder um, or alternatively we can set out a, um, a point and then um, record that set out position later on for, for checking checking back in the office. So um, we're just going to just have a look at a few uh, little further bits of information about uh, RTK and some, some things that we, we know about it, some pros and cons and well other stuff. So uh, the radios can be a bit of a limitation however uh, we can use a repeater. A repeater radio can be used to extend the range over terrain or perhaps into 
holes and things like that. If, say, for instance, I'm working in a mine or something like that, it, use the repeater to get down into the mine where it's, it's quite deep. Um, basically what happens is the correction uh, from the base is radioed to the repeater. The repeater then repeats the correction and radios it to the rover. So it enables, you could put it on the top of a high hill and go from one side of the hill to the other, whereas radio coverage, coverage through or around the hill may not be possible. GNSS is subject to atmospheric variations. Um, any sort of variation in the atmosphere can cause uh, little uh, delays to the signal or changes to the signal from the satellites, given that they're circulating the Earth and they're quite some way away. Um, in little um, various localised effects within the atmosphere can have, a, um, can have an impact on accuracy. Um, perhaps one of the main ones that we encounter is it, in terms of this is multi-pathing and this is where the signal from the satellite tends to bounce off large objects such as buildings or if you're particularly close to a power pole or fence um, issues such as what they call the urban canyon where you've got large tall, tall buildings that can um, not only restrict your you cause the multiplier thing but also restrict the amount of satellites that you can see at any one time the GNSS requires a clear sky with unobstructed views. So there are circumstances where the view may be obstructed so that certain satellites or sufficient satellites cannot be seen. Um, there's also ones where the uh, obstructions cause multipathing. So on the other hand, of course, GNSS works at night and in all weathers, although um, the data recorder can be a little bit susceptible um, to dampness, but usually if it's in good condition and has been serviced, that should be a, not a problem. Uh, I've talked about the height of the instrument being a critical factor. So too is the height of the or the, the height of the uh, base rec uh, receiver being a uh, critical factor. So too is the height of the rover pole. Uh, we must take care to make sure that we keep that. Um, correct at all times given that some poles we can vary them in height and we must remember to change the height of the pole when we change the physical height of the pole. Also affecting the pole can be the verticality, the circular bubble may be slightly out. Now any errors where you're doing critical errors to say control points and things like that, um, this pole error can be eliminated by taking two measurements 180 degrees apart and averaging the results. So um, so you would take a measurement, perhaps uh, one measurement, spin the pole through 180 degrees, take another one and then either average the results in the instrument or when you get back in the office. Now one of the things with GNSS in particular um, is that it can throw up sort of quite random errors and quite large random errors just on the odd occasion due to all of the factors involved and this what we usually do is one of the ways that we get around this is we take two measurements to critical control points um, or other sort of critical marks that we're going to use at least an hour apart you possibly could go below the hour but generally an hour apart to um, critical marks and average the results this means that you're getting a changing, the satellite constellation is changing at all times. So this is, means you're getting a different solution to the measurements from the satellites. If, if you're getting um, the measurements from the satellites might come in, at times you can get up to 17 satellites. So they give um, a, what we call a solution where each measurement is resolved to give the best um, fix on the position. So if we do this um, to a point on two occasions, and this can this is uh, really great for um, eliminating the effects of random, random sort of large random errors that can come up from time to time for a variety of reasons. So uh, there you go. That's um, some just some basic uh, information um, for if you're using a GNSS RTK GNSS. And this is generally what most um, surveyors in construction field are using. You need to know where you are at the time, not an hour afterwards by
post processing your results in the office and saying oh yeah well you were there but no RTK gives you tells you exactly where you are in real time 